So number 21 says we have a linear transformation. T from a vector space V to a vector space W and the dimension of V is equal to F and um, that F1 up to F sub K <coughs> be a linearly independent subset of the kernel of T. So that means T of each of these vectors F sub I is zero for all I from one up to K because it's in the kernel. Um, and there's a typo I see, it says, it says, should say, prove that if this is a lowercase v, is a vector in v, and t of v is not zero, then if I take the set of vectors f1 up to fk and I add v to each of them, then v plus f1 v plus f2, v plus f3, up to v plus fk is a linearly independent subset of v. So it's linearly independent. So I guess we should say the following. Suppose some linear combination of these vectors, c1, v plus f1, plus c2, v plus f2, up to ck v plus fk, which I can write as summation, I go from one up to k, c sub i v plus f sub i. Suppose this is the zero vector. So what does that say? Well, if that's the zero vector. Um, T of zero is always zero. So T of zero is T of this sum. Summation I goes from one up to K, C sub I V plus F sub I, which is summation, because this is linear, T is a linear transformation. I goes from one to K, C sub I, T of V, plus F sub I, let me make this clear. T of V plus F sub I, which is so zero is still summation. I goes from one to K, C sub I, T of V plus T of F sub I. And T of all these F sub I's are zero. So this is summation C sub I, I goes from one up to K times the vector T of V. And T of V is different from zero, but this is just some scalar. So <coughs> so T of V different from zero means that the sum of all of these coefficients, I goes from zero up to K is equal to zero. Hmm, what does that say? Um, this 
go back to where we had started. We had zero is summation CI V plus FI. I goes from one to K. This is summation CIV. I goes from one to K plus summation CIFI, I goes from one to K. <coughs> but we just showed that this is zero and zero times any vector is zero. So this is summation CIFI, I goes from one to K. But these vectors are linearly independent. So this means that all of these scalars have to be zero. which means that the set of vectors V plus F1, V plus F2, up to V plus FK is a, linearly in, is a linearly independent set. So that is certainly one of many possible proofs of this result. So in cryptography, problem 4.3, we're told Samantha has an RSA signature scheme with N, which is going to be a product of two primes equal to this number, 2721, 232, 5191, and E, which is the encryption key, 2282, 446, 9379. So the only way you can forge Samantha's signature is if you can factor that number. Now, I am 100% certain that no one can factor that number without a computer. So if you have a computer, I mean, if again, if you took calculus and Lehman, you could always try to use Maple. Um, let's see if Maple can factor that number. If you're in computer science, you should be able to write a program or have access to a program that factors numbers. 272. One, two, three, two, five, one, nine, one. Uh huh. So Maple is not that powerful, but Maple did factor this number. It turns out that this number is equal to two hundred and ten thousand eighty one times. 128,311. So P is 212081 and Q is 128311. And we have the number E. So we have to know, first of all, that E, so this is P, let's say, and this is Q. So we have to know that the greatest common divisor of E and P minus one, Q minus one is equal to one. So this is certainly going to be the case because we're told that Samantha is using this RSA digital signature method. So let me just double check because I like to check things. Um, I want to know what is the greatest common divisor of this ridiculously large number E, which is 2282446937 and P minus 1, 212080 times Q minus 1. One, two, eight, three, ten. 
and they are relatively prime, according to Maple. So I have to find the number D. So I want to compute D such that D times E is congruent to one modulo Q minus one, Q minus one, which means I want to find a number D such that this huge number E times D is congruent to one modulo um, this product, you know, whatever it turns out to be, you just have to multiply it out. And again, the only way you can solve this is using, using a computer. Um, you know how to, to use the Euclidean algorithm to compute D and then to write one as a linear combination of D and E. And, um, and that gives you the answer, but I can't calculate it for you. This is, this is a programming problem for people in computer science. Yeah. All right, Professor, I think, I think I got it pretty much. Thank you. Right. But you know, this is, um, if you like a practical subject then you have to be able to compute things. On an exam, I would never give you a problem like this, but you can't do it. Um, but as a homework problem, it's an interesting problem because it forces you to work with moderately big numbers. So this is linear algebra, page 236, problem number seven. We have a linear transformation T from V to W and V prime is a subspace of V. So you have a picture maybe like this, here's V, here's W and the linear map T from V to W and sitting inside of V you have a subspace V prime so you can just restrict T to V prime and it sends every vector in the subspace V prime into W. So, oh, so all we have to show is, so we want to, so let me call this maybe um, um, T prime from V prime to W is the, restriction of T to V prime. That just means if V is a vector in V prime, then T prime of V is just T of V, right? If you take a vector in here, just apply T to it. So we wanna show that T prime, which is written often like this, the this is just a vertical line, the restriction of T to V prime is a linear transformation. So that's really straightforward. V1 and V2 yeah. are. I got another job I'll be making. Six days. Like, I grounded, bro. I got to man. So if V1 and V2 are in V prime, then T prime of V1 plus V2 is just T. Well, first of all, V1 and V2 are in V prime, then V1 plus V2 is also in V prime, because V prime is a subspace, it's closed under vector addition. And T prime of V1 plus V2 is just T of V1 plus V2, but T is linear. So this is T prime of V1 and T prime of V2. So this proves that the additive requirement for a linear transformation is satisfied. And if V1 is in V prime, then any scalar times V1 is in V prime. And T prime of C V1 is T of C V1, but T is linear. This is C T of V1, which is C T prime of V1. So the second condition for a linear transformation is satisfied. So if you have a linear transformation from a vector space V to W and you restrict it to the subspace of V, the restriction 
is another linear, still a linear transformation. That's that's the whole thing. So in cryptography, we use groups. So a group is just a set of objects with some binary operation. So for example, you can take the group of integers, Z equals the integers. And the operation, the binary operation It's just addition. So for any pair of numbers X and Y, you can add them, right? This is all we mean by a binary operation. Given two elements of the set, you can get a third element of the set. So if I give you seven and 19, you get 26. That's the binary operation, you just add them, okay? Or you could have uh, R minus zero to be the non-zero real numbers. And the binary operation could be multiplication. So if I gave you, you know, three halves and the square root of two, and you multiply them, you get three halves times the square root of two. If I gave you seven <laughs> and 19, and you multiply them, you would get, uh, I think, 133, right? So in the set of integers, there's a binary operation of addition. In the set of non-zero real numbers, there's a binary operation of multiplication. So a group is just a set that comes with some binary operation. And sometimes you write it as addition, sometimes as multiplication. The book just uses the symbol star to denote what it is. And the binary operation has to satisfy three simple properties. It has to be associative. That means if you have A times B times C, that's the same as A times B times C. Or you could have addition there. And there has to be an identity element. So some element, let's say E, where A times E and E times A is always equal to A. So like for multiplication, the identity is the number one. For addition, the identity is the number zero, right? It depends on your group. And you also have to have the existence of inverses so that for all elements A in the group, there is an element B in the group such that A times B and B times A are both equal to the identity. So this is the formal complete definition of a group. And many of the things you're used to are groups, like adding integers and multiplying real numbers, adding matrices or multiplying matrices. It's typically a group operation. Um, yeah, but as I say, people spend their lives studying groups because there's a whole theory about them which is uh, very well developed. And we haven't talked about this very much in cryptography, but all the <coughs> all <coughs> the codes we're using are really based on groups. So if you look at congruence classes mod M, so we looked at congruences, um, that forms an additive group. And non-zero congruence classes modulo or prime form a multiplicative group. And that's the basis of the RSA crypto system. But I was able to talk about it without using the word group, because that would have gotten us too far afield in a summer course, which is very short. So in cryptography, you asked about problem 212. 
So it says, okay, G is a group. And D is a positive integer. And we define a subset of G, D square brackets D, which is all the elements in the group, such that if you take G to the dth power, so this is a multiplicative group. We're using multiplication as the group operation. This just means you multiply G with itself D times, and G to the dth power is the identity. So, first of all, we want to prove that G inverse is in this set. Well, we already have that E is G to the D. G to the D means you multiply G with itself D times. So that's G. So it's just like, for example, G cubed is g times g squared. Or you could write g cubed is g squared times g, right? So g to the d is g to the d minus one times g. And it's also g times g to the d minus one, which means if I take the element g and I multiply it by g to the d minus one, I get the identity. So G inverse is G to the power D minus one. And I want to show that this G inverse is in this set. So I must show that G inverse to the D is equal to the identity because this set G square brackets D is all elements of the group whose D power is the identity. And G inverse to the D, this is really the same as G to the D inverse. And this is just like rules of exponents. G to the minus three is like G cubed to the minus one. So, but G to the D is the identity and the inverse of the identity is the identity. So, if G is in this set, which means G to the, in fact, I, didn't, I could have made it shorter. If G is in the set, G to the D is in the identity. So here, this is really all I need to say. If G to the D is the identity, then G inverse to the D, which is G to the D inverse, is E inverse is E. That's it. So therefore G inverse is in G squared brackets D. So again, you're not used to group theory, so to understand everything I'm writing, you have to look at it sort of like symbol by symbol and make sure that it, everything is justified and it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, you say a group G is commutative, means that G1 times G2 is equal to G2 times G1 for all elements in the group. I mean, this is true for addition of integers and multiplication of real numbers, but not every group is commutative. But if the group is commutative, this is always true. And then if you take G1 times G2 to the dth power, this means you're multiplying G1 times G2 times G1 times G. Let me just do it three times. So you can rearrange these things. This is the same as. G1, G1, G1 times G2, G2, G2. If the group is commutative, you can rearrange these factors. So this is G1 cubed times G2 cubed. And if D is equal to three, each of these is the identity. That's the identity times the identity, which is the identity.
So what this says is that if the group is commutative and you look at this g square brackets d, it's closed under multiplication and it contains the inverse of each of its elements and then it's a group, that's part c. Okay. But I say this is something that you have to study for a while to understand these arguments. 